Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to Catalog and Cocktails, presented by Data.World, the data catalog for leveraging agile data governance to power people and data. I'm coming to you live from Austin, Texas, and you'll find out where else we're coming to you live from in just a moment. It's an honest, no BS, non-salesy conversation about enterprise data management with tasty beverages in our hands. And a shout out before we get started to Data.World Summit, which is coming up on Thursday, September 22nd. Get registered, go to Data.World, amazing guests. The theme is people plus data, so check it out. I'm Tim Gasper, longtime data nerd and product guy at Data.World, and this is Juan. Hey, Tim, I'm Juan Cicada, principal scientist at Data.World, and we are here live, 11 p.m. We do this live. We, we are very happy to do this live, and we are in Paris. Paris, France, with my good friend, Ole. How are you doing, Ole? I'm doing fine, uh, Juan. Thank you. Thank you for having me here on uh, uh, Catalog and Cocktails. So Ole, for those who you don't know, because if you don't know about Ole and you listen to our podcast, you've been li literally living underneath the rock, is the author of the upcoming O'Reilly book on Enterprise Data Catalog. And I am so excited that we had the chance to meet here live and have this podcast. Yeah. Face to face here because yeah, I think we've been yeah. having the podcast already for the last two hours while at dinner, and yeah, I think we're probably totally. going to continue doing it after this and tomorrow and so forth. So I'm so happy. So let's kick it off with our 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 tell and toast. Uh, what are we drinking? What are we toasting for? Hey Tim, what are you drinking in Austin right now at 4 p.m.? Well, right now 4 p.m. I'm drinking a ginger raspberry and gin. So that's what I got going on. Something kind of light and refreshing. What about y'all? What are you drinking? It looks like you got some some fun stuff there. It's a Burgundy wine, uh, uh, cultivated uh, in, in a bio way, so uh, very naturally. Uh, that's it. Yep, we're having some French wine because we're in France right now, and I think we're just toasting because we are here in person. And I'm just, uh, I think, just a personal note here: we've been interacting, I know, since I think since April, March, and April, and it's just been a really cool kind of just getting to know each other and talking about metadata, knowledge, data catalogs, and everything. And we finally get to meet after so many, many months talking. So I'm just super excited for that. Cheers! Yeah, yeah, likewise, one. Yeah, cheers, cheers Tim. Cheers, Tim. I'm excited for your book, which is coming soon. That's going to be awesome. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Yeah, and just a quick reminder. we, uh, Tim and I are both going to be next week in London at the Big Data London uh, conference. Uh, we're both going to be giving a talk um, on data products, and we're going to be doing some special shows, I think, on Wednesday and Thursday. Now we're doing live shows of Catalog and Cocktails, so don't miss that. Um, all right, let's kick it off with our warm-up question today. So, if a data catalog were a cocktail, a drink, a spirit, alcohol, whatever, what would it be? And that question is for me, right? We're all of us. So yeah, I got an yeah. answer. You go first. Uh, I think that um, regardless of whether it was a wine or spirit, it wouldn't be something that you would blend with anything. It would be very simple and pure, and it would just uh, age beautifully. That's a very powerful answer right there. <laughs> Tim, what do you have to say? <laughs> That's actually a great articulation. I, I was actually going in some different directions. I was thinking, well, maybe it's like a scotch because like at first, maybe you're a little like, oh, I don't know if that's what I'm into. But then over time, as you mature your taste, you're like, actually, this is what I need. This is my go-to, right? And then it becomes the center of a lot of stuff, right? So that was the scotch argument. But then I was actually thinking maybe it's more like vodka for actually the opposite reason that you said, Ole, because I was like, well, vodka goes with everything and metadata and catalog can go with everything. So I <laughs> <laughs> that's also a very good answer too. well i i think as a catalog you want there's going to be so many different facets of what you're going to be cataloging and i think wine for me is something that just so many different facets i mean the geography around the the types of grapes the types of notes that you get on the smell on the nose and on the nose on the taste i think it just make you, you want to be able to have a catalog that can deal with all that complexity and simplicity so that's why, for me, a data catalog, I'm, I'll relate that to wine. That, yeah. that, that's a great answer. I like that. And wine is so faceted that it, you could benefit from a catalog of wines, which <laughs> there are some sites that do a good job of that. <laughs> oh, for sure, for sure. Yeah, I mean, actually, just uh, kind of a, for people to know, like we've actually been creating our own data.world data catalog of all the catalog and cocktails episodes 
not just episodes of topics, but also, but all the cocktails. And we got a couple surprises coming Ooh. up for sure. So, oh, nice. Nice. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right, let's kick it off. We got so much to talk about. And I know we've talking for months that so we can go so many places. Yeah. So, all right, let's kick it off. Honest, no BS. Where the hell are data catalogs going? Uh, yeah, uh, big question. Um, I think to provide a short answer that data catalogs should uh, look at uh, much more at unstructured data and really become a uh, search engine for companies like the the, the way to, to find whatever you need, whatever knowledge you need to find in your organization. This is interesting. You're saying that the, the one thing is unstructured data. Yeah. Okay. So I think we got covered the structured data part, the unstructured data. Let, let me go pause there for a second. Why not? Uh, are you already assuming that data catalogs today are already doing semi-structured data very well, like cataloging all types of, I don't know, APIs and, and Kafka's and, and, and JSON streams and uh, XML stuff that we may be having? I mean, yeah. Is that is that is is that being addressed today, or is there still a room for improvement there? Uh, definitely room for improvement, but I also think that depends very much on uh, on the vendors, right? I see. So, what about so one of the things that I find fascinating about all our conversations is that I personally, and I think Tim and I, we come from more of the the the, the computer science background, mm -hmm. and you have this very it, this non-traditional background from like from the technologists that we have, which is one, the, the information and library sciences. And I think one of the things that I've really been passionate about while we, uh, through our discussion is that you bring this different perspective that when I go off and, and I chat with our customers, our prospects, when I'm at conferences, they're not thinking about it the way you are thinking about this. Mm -hmm. So in a nutshell, what is the what is the library and information sciences world bringing to the table when it comes to data catalogs that people are not thinking about right now? Yeah. Um, high level again, I think my perspective on data catalogs really is about uh, providing a, a way to organize data and search for data in a way that uh, just increases the efficiency of data catalogs generally. So I'm very occupied with search and, and the way you can search uh, for data via a data catalog. And I know this is perhaps not like, there's been many discussions around accessing data and I, of course, uh, data mesh is a big topic and it, it kind of goes up and then it goes down and up again and down again. And so people are wondering whether or not this is the future or not. I think it, a, a separate discussion here really is search and, and how we search for data. I think that many of us have been raised with this search engine Google-like uh, um state of mind where we could just type a word and find everything that we we wanted i still think that holds a lot of truth but i think search and we will discuss this later also is something that needs to be considered in a more nuanced way where we also look at different information needs so sometimes we do not in, need one specific thing we do not need one hit we would need more hits and in some cases we would need many 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 hits to to actually um find the things that we want to find in the catalog so in that sense are you saying ole that the search paradigm of google and the search paradigm in a metadata sense or catalog for your data is a little different that maybe uh, when you say like uh, more hits less hits i i sense um more ability to like what is your use case like depending on your use case to adjust how you approach it is that kind of a good way of thinking of it uh totally i don't think that catalogs should move away from a, a google paradigm i i think that it should just be supplemented with with other ways of searching for data that are perhaps not as fast and as precise but opens to a bigger set of uh, hits that it just expresses another form of recall, actually. Mm -hmm. So so I don't think that we should move away from this smooth search engine-like feeling. Not at all. Very much uh, the contrary. I think that we, sh we should keep this 
this uh, this powerful way of searching, but but supplement it. Yeah. Interesting. Well, so so one of the things that we've discussed a lot when it comes to search is what you've been calling and you have in your book called the information retrieval query language. Mm -hmm. And this was this the first time we discussed this. And it was really hard for me to understand because, first of all, you use the word query language. Yeah. And as a computer scientist, right, I think about query, query language and maybe like SQL. And I'm like, wait, what do you mean by this? Mm -hmm. and, and, and my my understanding after a lot of discussions was like, oh, this is really just an expressive, more kind of advanced search capabilities of how you want to go totally. have Boolean types of queries and not just Boolean, but you want to be able to go group and have negation these things. Mm -hmm. So we also discuss this whole ex expressive kind of a spectrum about search. And I'm looking here at the comment that we have from a LinkedIn user who says like, hey, why not thinking about a data catalog as an application that helps the users to find the most valuable data sets versus search for data? Isn't then is this the same or is this different? Um, I mean, searching for data. Let me look at the question just a second. Why not thinking about a data catalog as an application that helps users to find the most valuable data sets versus search data. Yeah, I think that, so the way I think of that question is actually a way of like uh, assessing whether or not you're looking for, for the most precise hit in, uh, in a universe of knowledge or whether or not you're looking for a lot of potentially relevant hits. And so if you're looking for a precise hit, then I think a search engine capability is, is just the way to go. But if you're looking for like a, a recall of, of many potentially relevant hits, then you would be um, needing a, a more detailed uh, query uh, system or language. Is that is that kind of what the question uh, alludes to? I hope so. If not, please respond, whoever it is. Well, I, I don't know, T T Tim. How, how do you perceive the, uh, the the situation about accessing what is inside of a catalog? Because I mean, this is when we start thinking about is is data metadata. Your data is my metadata, and so forth, and how we're accessing it. Because I know you, we we have different perspectives. I want to hear you, what you think about this, Tim. Yeah, no, totally. And then I'm curious, Swan, what you would say, and and Ole, what your what your thoughts on this? I, I think there's. The paradigm that we've been forced into, and then I think there's the paradigm that I think we all wish that existed, but doesn't for, for obvious complexity reasons. And I think the situation that we're forced into that can be fine, right, is I think we as a space are very, um, uh, we segment metadata and we segment from data, right? Where it's very much like I want to search and I'm searching for knowledge and I'm searching across concepts and I'm searching across my data sets and things like that. But it's all at that metadata level. Uh, and then we talk about this analogy of like shopping for data, where you, now you've found the data product or the data asset you want to get access to, and now you're going to request access to it. And then maybe you might, once you have access to it, then you can query it and you can actually work with the data itself. And um, I, I think that, you know, that separation works because, you know, and we've kind of been forced into it because of security and things like that. Um, but in an ideal world, I mean, ideally, metadata and data would be kind of more intermixed. And it would, you know, and, and, and the facts that lie within the data and the metadata, it's all data. And I think that's where search starts to get really interesting. But um, I don't know. That's that's kind of my take on like where we're at versus where we're going. Kind of curious about y'all's take on that. We've we've had this discussion about searching for data and searching for searching in data. Yeah. And I think this is the distinction that you clearly make within within your book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ex expand on this. Yeah, totally. So so uh, Tim, in my view, I will expand on that. But there is actually also another point I want to get back to, Tim, uh, in, in, in your comment. Uh, so, so in my um, book, I rely very much on the, on the fact that in information, library information science, a catalog is always uh, conceptualized as a reference database. And what this means is that it refers the users to data that resides outside of the database itself. Now, it's it's not a technical definition of a database. It's a conceptual understanding of, of a collection of, of data that actually refers uh, people to sources outside itself. And it's a natural understanding of catalogs in, uh, in, in libraries uh, 
digitized uh, uh, catalogs works in this way in, in any kind of collection of uh, books or archives or whatever you have. And a catalog works very much in the same way. It shows uh, different data sources, IT systems, uh, at a metadata level. And so when you search for those things in a catalog, in a data catalog, you are kind of you're referred outside the catalog and into the IT systems themselves. And so in that way, mm -hmm. data catalogs can be conceptualized as reference databases. And the consequence in terms of search here is that you need to apply a different kind of search uh, language to effectively um, find everything you need in different scenarios. Now, we all have these simple search uh, search experiences with uh, search engines, and that, that those are also true for, for very good data catalogs. But in many uh, professional contexts, we also need to retrieve um, data that is expressed in longer um, queries or longer information needs. And that is where you need this, this information retrieval query language. We can perhaps go a bit more into detail about that. But, but I want to touch upon the, another thing also, Tim, that you mentioned here. And that is um, it's, uh, it's the shopping experience that you mentioned. And I... I got to say, I disagree with this, this notion of a shopping experience. And, and it's That's uh, interesting. Go on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can I no, no, go, go in? The, yes. Go in and we'll see if I, uh, we'll see if we agree or disagree. Go. Yeah. So totally. I, I don't want no, to like, uh, like us to, to agree on everything. It's just that a shopping experience, right? Uh, when you shop online, is something where you are presented with things that are more or less tempting to you that you want to consume. And I, I don't at all oppose the idea of, for example, data as a product and, and all these uh, things. I, I, I really do think that's a very relevant uh, idea. But the, 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 the challenges I think that we have with, with shopping experience when it comes to to data catalogs is that fundamentally you will be needing to search for stuff that uh, contradicts a shopping experience. You will be in need as a data governance person or a, a compliance person or a, just a lawyer or whoever is searching in the data catalog you will be in need of finding stuff that are that is complicated to find and not perhaps expressed very logically so so the shopping experience tells you something else it gives you offers that you would want to consume that persuade you to to consume certain stuff and there's nothing negative about that but sometimes search just just doesn't mimic a shopping experience. So so let me, I think I agree with you and disagree with you on a couple of things. So one is, I think we're, we're using the word search very generically here. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to understand the, 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 one, the personas, but also what you also bring up is the information needs that those personas may have. Yeah, totally. So, so if somebody has a very specific information need that they know that they're looking for something specifically, I would argue that they know what they want. Now, there may be some serendipity of saying, hey, you want this thing, but you know other people who had similar needs also bought or got this other thing, so you may want that too. But they started with something very specific and they, they, they found what they needed. Now, then there is another scenario where it's like, I don't know exactly what I need very specifically, but I kind of know. So mm. I, that's where I, I'm not, I don't know. I'm not looking for that one specific thing that I'm putting in my shopping cart. I need to go and start navigating around these things. Yeah. That's the thing is that's a second scenario. And then mm -hmm. a third scenario, which I would argue is, is, is a subset of that first one, which was, I know, I'm looking for some, a very specific thing is I'm looking for a very specific kind of, uh, complex um, specification. I need to go find 
data that has been done this, that has touched this, that hasn't been touched by this, that goes into this thing, right? So mm -hmm. you want a much more expressive way of searching that, not just by kind of like, oh, I'm, I'm looking for data about customers or orders, mm -hmm. right? So which yeah. is what I consider that first one. So I think if you're searching for, I need data about customers, then yeah, you find a bunch of stuff, you put in the shopping cart and that's what I want. Mm -hmm. If you're searching for like, I, I, I don't even have the clear requirements, but I maybe even have a hypothesis or intuition, then then yeah, you don't even know what you want to go. You're, you're really just navigating. You're not even putting anything in the shopping cart. So I agree and disagree with you. I don't know. I've been ranting here. Tim, Tim, what are your points about? What are your thoughts? Uh, so I, I don't think I necessarily disagree with what you're saying. I, I think where my mind is going is how shopping complements a good uh, search experience. And it's one potential modality of, oh, I'm searching for a product, which maybe if we translate in, that into data speak, right? Maybe that's like, you know, a lot of data and a lot of your data assets aren't, aren't data products. When they are, then having a shopping experience can make sense if you don't yet have access to that data or, you know, if you've got, you know, uh, different departments that, you know, have accounting practices around how data has to be accounted for and things like that, then maybe that's where the shopping experience comes in. And I guess where my mind started to go was actually extending, Ole, your uh, Google analogy. I was thinking about how Google has Google Shopping, right, where it now is indexing lots of different uh, products out there. And, and if you're searching for something that feels shopping related, then you're going to get directed to, uh, to the shopping experience, but it, it, it complements the overall so search flow. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know if I have any conclusions based on that, but I'm curious if, uh, if that triggers anything uh, from your perspective. I think that's a very nice way of perspective of providing a little perspective, uh, Tim, I, I really do. Um, let me tell you a short story from back in the days, uh, where I was just uh, fresh out of, uh, of, of university and uh, in my I'm in my first position, I I would find stuff. I was working for this big pharmaceutical company in uh, in, in in Denmark where I live in, in Copenhagen. Uh, it's called Novo Nordisk, and and I was like asked to to find. I work in this information management department, and I could find a lot of stuff. During audits and inspections, we were asked to, to retrieve stuff very, very fast. So, for example, I think I mentioned to, this to you over the phone, Juan, one time, and the inspectors could ask, okay, what uh, was the pH value of this fermentation tank in the month of February in this specific uh, uh, site in Novo Nordisk, like a fermentation tank in a specific site in, in, in this company? Uh, during the month of uh, March in uh, 1996. And so that's a very, very precise uh, information need. I, I need one hit to that answer. But but the sh there will never be a shopping experience a, a, around such, such, a, such a search because it's too detailed. Um, but there needs to be a structure that facilitates the retrieval of, of, of that hit, right? So so I think, just to compliment you here, Tim, that I think that below the search experience, there needs to be something that's a little more raw, but that is good enough so that we can find the stuff we need. And that's very much the space that I'm arguing in, in, in data catalogs. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, and this is an interesting segue to some other things that we've talked about in the past as we were kind of preparing for this episode today, where you've done a lot of thought around how cataloging intersects and is can be very well informed by uh, you know traditional computer science and information science and even like library science concepts C can you talk a little bit about how those concepts relate and how they impact search and and sort of metadata in general Oh yeah, yeah. So it's a it's a big con concept. Uh, it can go in many directions. Um, we've already touched upon information retrieval query languages, right? Um, if I should uh, bring about some other concepts, it could, for example, be ontology. Uh, we designed uh, in my when I studied uh, library information science, we designed ontologies uh, all the time. I did an ontology of a of a zoo, actually. It's a pretty cool ontology. Like think of all the buildings and all the animals and everything that you have to link together, build that ontology. It's pretty, 
pretty fun actually. So, so building ontologies, for example, is something that's completely native to uh, to information science. And now we have the the possibility to actually uh, not only design these ontologies uh, conceptually, but like putting them, get, get, bringing them into life in a data catalog, in a truly like. Uh, at least if it's a knowledge graph based uh, data catalog, right? And, and th this is one of the things I am super excited and why we why we really clicked on this is because because of your background and my background too. Where we've clicked on the whole issue of sa of semantics of knowledge of of ontologies and how the ontologies is just a way of being able to go represent knowledge. And what we've talked about a lot about here is that it, I actually don't. I mean, I say this again. Like the, the word "data catalog" is something that I think is is, is not enough. It doesn't. It, it really should be a data and, and knowledge catalog because you really want to go catalog how what the business represents, or you want to you want to be able to catalog represent that knowledge and that knowledge. How is that knowledge represented such that you can catalog it yeah. as an ontology? Mm -hmm. And and I think part of that is it goes into well, does this does this can does this automatically exist? Can I go create that? I mean, do I have to go talk to people? These, this is the social technical phenomenon that we have to go occur, right? That we have to go, it may exist in some part of processes that you may be able to, you can extract that. But at the end, either if you talk, talk to people and you're interviewing them or you're able to extract those processes from somewhere, you are building an ontology. You're really representing the way how your domain works. And I think that is something that a catalog needs to have, hence why it's more than a data catalog. I don't know. Are, are we on? This is my true belief what are your thoughts here yeah yeah um i think i need to get a little closer to the mic still um i um i very much agree on this i think uh, that that catalogs uh, will evolve uh, into um, machines or repositories or whatever we want to call them that represents uh, knowledge uh, to a to a more like intellectually satisfying level than just data itself so so i very much agree so and, and many of the the concepts that that come to mind uh same uh, to your question uh, still are questions or uh, concepts uh, such as um for example uh tesoros i mean i also uh, I've, I'm very accustomed with building a tesori that's like a, a very finely uh, structured vocabulary of like of like a thesaurus. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a source. Those things I I, I also finally see um, uh, as something that is possible to build with a data catalog. So I think many of the concepts, many of the methodologies that were applied at a conceptual level or, or more raw technological level in information science is, is, is finally uh, being uh, executed or and, coming into life. By and and I, I think I think if you look at catalogs just in general today, like yeah, having a business glossary is that first step, right? You're just mm -hmm. very, very basically scratching the surface here. And then you go into like that next level, which is having a thesaurus, right? How yeah. these different words are related to each other and so forth. And then mm -hmm. you start adding more relationships. Oh, this word, this, this term of an order is placed by a customer. So that relationship there, and then you can start adding much more detailed kind of expressivity of what that, what that knowledge means. But I think the way you start out was, is with a glossary, but little by little, you want to be able to go start cataloging more of that knowledge of an organization. Yeah. Totally, totally. So one thing we need to go talk about, which yeah. is the life cycles of data. So, all right, I just said life cycle of data. Go, go, go rant. Yeah, yeah. One of the things that I discuss in my book and that I really would uh, like to have more, uh, like, focus on is, is, is data life cycles, also system life cycles, and also the life cycles of assets in, in catalogs. So the reason I'm very occupied with this is that traditionally in information management, uh, data management, uh, life cycle is, is, a, is a big thing. Like how for how long time should we keep uh, a specific kind of data in our company? 
for how long time do we keep data about a specific call that we had with, a, if you're in the life sciences, uh, an HCP uh, healthcare professional? That really depends on whether or not it's subject to GDPR or if a, a sample of a specific uh, product that uh, your company is providing was delivered uh, to this person, this HCP. Because if it's GDPR, then you have to keep the data for two years. And if, if you delivered a sample of your pro of product, then uh, you have to keep the data about this call for 10 years. Now, this is very, very difficult to, to, uh, to manage. <laughs> it's very, very difficult to manage. I've tried doing that. And I think that data catalogs provide a big uh, potential here. If we can, if we can get control of uh, the data lifecycle uh, via a data catalog. So I hope this uh, resonates a little bit with you, but just to provide a little more context, uh, this is not something that is not taken care of today, but but like a data lifecycle has several phases, and the last phases of a data catalog is of a of a data asset is uh, is the dispose phase, and it's typically in the dispose phase where you gain control of the retention period of saying, okay, we will place this data in this storage solution until the end of the retention period. And so what the data catalog actually offers is to, yeah. And it's very, very difficult to get control of the data life cycle at the latest phase of it, of the life of the data in the dispose phase. Now the data catalog actually proposes or offers the possibility of gaining control of the, of the life cycle earlier when we store and share the data, far earlier in the life of the data. So it's a big potential here for data catalogs. It's not fully developed yet, but but I see gaining control of the data lifecycle as something that is a potentially big, big win for, for data catalogs. Right. Yeah. You mentioned a couple of, of steps here as part of an overall lifecycle. And, and just before I ask this next question, I want to mention that um, this episode is, is brought to you by Data.World. Uh, the data catalog for Data Mesh, a whole new paradigm for data empowerment. To learn more, go to data.world. Um, and Ole, when you mentioned like store and share and you mentioned dispose, like these are actually things that come from a framework, right? An information science framework of P-O-S-M-A-D, POSMAD, plan, obtain, store or share maintain, apply, and dispose, which I'll be honest, I was not very familiar with in the past. And when you brought it up to Juan and I, I was like, wow, this makes a lot of sense. And it's actually a very simplifying framework for thinking about data lifecycle. And obviously catalog can play an important part across that entire lifecycle. Um, you know, what, what, you know, what is POSMAD something that you're thinking a lot of when you think about how a, a catalog can be effective? And, and do you see it playing a, a key role around that? Yeah, totally. So the the impression I have of data catalogs so far, I've worked with a couple of data catalogs in my uh, in my uh, professional life, and and of course now that I'm writing the book, that I'm getting to to meet a lot of data catalog vendors. The impression I have of data catalogs is that they they simply reflect what is out there. So it's it's a mirror of the present. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if this sounds too spacey, but it's like if you mirror what's just the the data in production, you're not you're not taking into account that data has a life of its own, and the fact that data has a life of its own is something that is subject to many very difficult management questions uh, around data. It's very, very difficult to get an overview of data. But once you have that overview of data, you can begin to control the life cycle of data, retention periods of data, which is a big, big thing and will become an even more important thing. And so, and so the tendency that I've seen in data catalogs is simply to mirror what's out there in production. And that's a nice thing. It's totally a nice thing. But the fact is that we have no other tool to control the life cycle of data. In, the, in all the source systems, it's just a matter of a, a lot of uh, service delivery managers trying to, 
provide specifications on how long time the data should be kept in all those systems. But if the data catalog can provide that, it becomes a key player, not something that limits innovation or puts a another layer of governance on top, nothing like that. It just provides smooth management of the data that you have in your organization in a life cycle perspective. Mm -hmm. And that's not something that's present yet, uh, yet in data catalogs. Well, and yeah, we have an interesting question here that I think piggybacks off of what you're talking about. And uh, um, uh, on LinkedIn, um, uh, one of our listeners asks, any chief data officer or data product owner needs to have a focus on data monetization for their data products to survive. In modern data architecture, most of the cost on the compute side uh, is on uh, is on the compute side versus the storage side. So how do we decide which data we want to remove since data that today has no value can be really valuable in two or three years potentially? So this is sort of like now that the, the data is in the in, in the catalog, like it's one thing to be a reflection of the present or to be a reflection of production, but then how do you actually leverage the catalog with your own knowledge to make good decisions about data? Yeah, I think there are two answers to that question. And the first answer is not an answer that I can give, I'm sorry. I, I wouldn't be able to provide a relevance. Um, uh, I think, okay, so to, to, to try to provide an answer to both, uh, both the dimensions in this question. I think it would be up to uh, domain experts to assess the relevance of data and whether or not we should keep it or not. So if you're going with a domain-based approach, uh, then, then you could rely on domains assessing the relevance of data in a couple of years from now. But there's another dimension to this that is not up for debate. And that is all the uh, legal requirements or regulations that your uh, company is subject to. The more regulated your company is, the, big, the bigger your company is, um, the more regulated it's likely to be. Uh, and uh, if we take, for example, the petrochemical industries, uh, they are heavily regulated. They need to document a lot of stuff and they need to keep this uh, data for a certain period of time. So it's not up for debate. We need to keep the data. It's just a question of how we keep it and where, where it is stored, of course, how it's accessible and so on, but we need to keep it. And so, for example, in the pharmaceutical sector, where I have worked uh, in a substantial part of my life, work life, you are forced to keep a lot of information, uh, a lot of data for the life of the product plus 35 years. That's the average life uh, time of a patient that has been consuming or using your product. So imagine keeping data for that period of time. If you have no overview of that, how do you want to manage it? And I have done that and it's totally possible to do with spreadsheets and very, very, very low tech solutions. But what the data catalog really offers here in this space is that you crawl the systems uh, that are running and that are supporting the value chain of your company as a, in the present. And if you combine that with the retention period, you get you you just get a, a data governance solution that is like something that we have not seen before anywhere in the industry. So that's the big potential of data catalogs. Yeah. Right? So, so the, the clear takeaway here is that we need to start thinking about how, what is the life cycle of data yeah. and how that is being managed, tracked. The data catalog needs to be doing that. that, that, that I mean, that that it's not doing it today, I would no, argue. Yeah, and, it's it, not, and, and that's it's the not. potential right now. And, 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 and this is really, really clear, important takeaway. And I think the whole pause mad, right? I, I, this is a very important thing for everybody to listen. Plan, obtain, store, share, maintain, apply, and dispose. Like, this is a really excellent framework. Mm -hmm. Another framework that we've talked a lot about, and it's something dear to my heart because I always talk about the data first to the knowledge first. Yeah. Data, information, knowledge, action, result. Okay. How does this, uh, let, let's break this back into like practical kind of setting and how should that be related to data catalogs? 
Yeah. So another thing, um, I'm very glad you you bring this up now, uh, Juan. Uh, if not, I would just have kept on ranting. Uh, but but the the Dika framework is uh, it's really not a life cycle. It's more like a like a like an interpretation uh, loop. So if we consider data as something that is generated by systems uh, in combination with human activity, then once we look at that data, interpret it, we can understand it. And then the Dika frameworks pr proposes that it becomes information. It's only when we interpret this data that we have in our source system that we understand it as something particular, and so it becomes information. Now, when we think further about the information, uh, what it is, uh, what it is used for, and in what context it is used, it becomes knowledge to us. We know that this kind of information in, is used in that, ki in that kind of uh, context and so on. So, so that's really what, what, this, um, what this framework proposes is that we need to look at data and interpret it, uh, interpret it to, to be able to understand it as information. And that, over time, creates knowledge. And with this knowledge, we can, uh, we can uh, act, and that will create results. So, so this is not a, this is not a total, like, this, this is not a formula of how knowledge is, is, is derived uh, in total. Uh, like in human uh, understanding and human thinking, but but thinking specifically about data, this little framework proposes a way to move from data towards knowledge. And I have of course followed you on on LinkedIn. We've been discussing a lot, Juan, and 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 I actually think that it's very important that data catalogs move away from data and towards knowledge. I also. I also argue this quite vividly in my book. Um, cheers! Yeah, cheers. I want to. I want to cheers on this. Just this is oh, just, virtually uh, cheers. Yeah, cheers <laughs> no, I mean, look, honest, honest, the honest, no BS thing here. Like, this is not just because I work at a company which is data world and this is it's a data catalog and we're trying to st stand out and whatever. No, no, this is I genuinely, I personally believe my heart is in this that. It is not just about the freaking data that's inside of the database. It's like, what the fuck does this mean? Mm -hmm. And understand that context and the people behind that. Because otherwise, insanity, the insights of insanity, keep doing the same thing over and over again. And we're not going to yeah. understand. So we really need to have this shift. And 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 I just, I, 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 it's just so annoying when people are like, I just want data. I just want data. Give me more data. It's like, no, no. You, okay, here's the data. So what? What are you going to do with it? Do you understand what this means? Mm -hmm. Go talk to somebody else about it. And I think this is the shift. So I am very, very happy that that you're really uh, that we're on the same page on this stuff. And 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 actually, this is the call to arms to folks. Is like, get out of just your data first world and start talking to other people around you. All right, that was my other rant of the day. Uh, Tim, back to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's perfect. Well, one one other comment that I'll have is that um, you know, people all the time refer to that uh, that sort of age-old analogy or progression of like, well, data to information, information to knowledge, and then knowledge to wisdom, right? And I, I think that's that's cute and it's fun and it's easy to remember, right? But it's it, it, it's a framework that has a very static connotation. It's a passive connotation, right? Which is like, we work so hard to build up all this context so that what? So that we can like swim in all this context and be like, yeah, this is a fun pool to swim in, right? Or is it to take action and to achieve results, right? And I think that's what's cool about this D-I-K-A-R framework here, sort of the actions and results, the A and the R, because that's um, a different way to think about why you're building up this knowledge in a way that's much more active and, and honestly, I think has a lot more return on investment oriented around it. Because I think a lot of times people talk about knowledge, they talk about ontologies and things like that. And a lot of times they go like, how does that impact my business? Right. And I think that, you know, it, you got to change the way you're thinking about it. Yeah. And, and, and to add to this and, and kind of take it to the next topic before we have to go to our lightning round, because I told you like we're, <laughs> time flies when we're having fun here. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, so on, on one aspect, 
the knowledge part, and you brought this up earlier when we we're talking about kind of the background of information library sciences, I think this is where we start thinking about ontologies. And I think in the past, ontologies has been like this really weird word that you want to go say, but at the end of the day, it's really about documenting, cataloging what something means and even a different perspective. So I think that data catalogs need to be dealing with ontologies, all right? I mean, that is that, that needs to be one of the other types of first-class citizens that they're cataloging, not just your tables and your columns to generate the lineage and the stuff. It's like, you need to say, hey, can you catalog ontologies too? Would you agree with that or disagree with that? Or No, no totally, totally I would agree with that. Um... Yeah, this is a boring answer. I just agree. Um, I think to provide a little more context, I think, uh, and, and also going back to the to the DIKR model, um, I don't think we can act properly just based on data. Uh, I don't think we can create the results we want just based on data. There's this middle layer where we need to understand what the data means and we can't do that just by looking at it. When we look at data, we understand it as information. We can say, okay, this is, for example, clinical data. But if we look at clinical data, recognize it as such, that does not give us an, that does not give us an, so clinical data, because I'm from, I like, I, I've worked so much of my uh, uh, life in pharmaceutical industries, right? But, but cl clinical data, interpreters and as, as information mean that humans recognize it as clinical data but it takes thorough analysis to derive knowledge from that looking at certain numbers of figures saying okay this actually looks like this person has cancer that's just not something you you look at something some some numbers and then you can say okay this is this is this is a result of a clinical study we can see that but to deduct something from that, to, to, to provide a diagnosis, it takes further analysis. It takes a long time. So that's why you need that knowledge layer before you can actually act. So one other thing what connected to the knowledge in something that we talk a lot about ourselves here and just what we're seeing a lot in the industry is this notion of knowledge graphs, when, especially when it comes to data catalogs and just managing, integrating so many different heterogeneous, diverse sources of data and metadata. I'm in the particular belief, just again, honest, no BS, outside of the vendor perspective, a graph is just the ideal structure of how to integrate data, in integrate anything, right? Because mm -hmm. you can represent anything back into a graph. Mm -hmm. That's why I truly believe that a, a catalog needs to be represented as a graph and it's the basis of it. What are your perspectives about this? Because I, I mean, we're, the market's going to so many different places of, is this a big thing for you or it's like, no, nah, it's just a feature or whatever? No, it's totally not a feature. I mean, it, uh, a knowledge graph based data catalog is something fundamentally different than a, a data catalog that is not based on a knowledge graph because it provides you with this flexible meta model that allows you to precisely map the organization you're in. And so so I think that holds a lot of potential. In my book, I discuss knowledge graphs as something that is key to future data catalogs because it provides such a sm more smooth mapping of your organization. But first and foremost, it provides uh, better search experiences. Okay, so so a, a data catalog powered by a knowledge graph gives you the full flexibility of metadata to, to really re precisely map what your organization means. Second, it gives us that whole first topic that we talked about a lot, mm. the entire search expressivity. Yeah, right? totally. So I think th those, are the, th those are two key fundamental aspects of a knowledge graph. Anything else to add around this? Because th this is something that... I, that we're talking, people are thinking about, is this, is this, do I really need to pay attention to that or not? Like, I mean, is there something else about the, the, mm. that the listeners should, should consider? Yeah, it's pretty much the same point, but elaborated a little bit. I think that knowledge graphs really um, provide the possibility of the combination of simple search and browse features in a way that is very nice. I discuss applied search in, in data catalogs uh, 
quite extensively in my book and and of course different search patterns and and, and especially, especially knowledge graphs really provide this uh, powerful simple search experience uh, with a browsing experience afterwards that is really nice because everything of relevance is attached to to the hit that you're you're finding right well this has been a fascinating discussion, and and I have to say I am extremely extremely excited that I mean before coming to this we were having dinner and then we're spending tomorrow talking so we're going to be really kind of just keeping this conversation going. Um, Tim, I think it's time to go to our lightning round. So uh, this is, again, I don't I, I wish we could continue, and we, we should probably do I think future episodes of like we'll we'll stop. And then we'll have like bonus episodes of the episode that we had. Yeah, if we're really on a roll, we should do like VIP content afterwards. And uh, I don't know, maybe this is like a special idea here. We need like to have like the VIP club and whoever's part of that can can hear all the good stuff, right? Yeah, well, we'll get there, right? All right, but anyway, let, let, let's move to our lightning round, which is uh, again presented by Data in Our World, the, the data catalog for successful cloud migration. Um, let me go first. Is reference data master data? Oh. Oh, that question, Juan. <laughs> that was really mean. Uh, <laughs> uh, so th these are lightning round questions, yes or no, and you can give a little bit of context. No, reference master, reference data is not master data. Give us some context. Uh, reference data can be just as subjective as anything else. Is that a uh, context enough? Or I mean, no. So. To clarify, I think master data we've, we were discussing is uh, the legacy of the legacy view of this is like oh, it's a single version of the truth. And, yeah, totally. So and that's I legacy. Yeah, it's, it, but it's it's necessary legacy. I want to add though, it, it mm -hmm. runs the it, it runs the operational backbone of a company to to have master data. So it's quite important, but it's not something that is very important in a analytical data um, platform. All right, that's interesting. Tim, you go. Yeah, I, I feel like these things happen in waves, you know, and like reference and master data kind of like comes back, and now people are asking a lot about it again. It's hot again. Um, so next, uh, next question. You mentioned uh, in our in our chat today that data shopping isn't necessarily a core part of the search focus that especially a catalog needs to focus on. But obviously, catalogs do get often pushed, and uh, you know, we'll speak as a vendor, right? Uh, get pushed into things like workflow and governance, right? Do you see that governance workflow and policy is separate from catalog? Like they're two things that although they get coupled together, they're separate or are they actually tightly coupled? Uh, I think that um, they are somewhat coupled. I don't think you should try to uh, resolve every data governance issue you have with a data catalog. Far from it. Uh, but it can provide some basic uh, features or capabilities that will enable you uh, to do data governance. But data governance is something that really has mission creep built into it, right? So you should watch out for that. All right, third question. Smarter search, ontologies, someone has to do this work. And I, we've been advocating for this role of the knowledge scientist or the knowledge engineer is this a role that you see that is that is emerging? Will it emerge? Oh, actually, Scott Hillman asked me the same question on Data Mesh Radio, and I answered. Uh, I think I answered no, and the more I thought about it, is uh, I regretted that answer. So, so I'll, I'll try to, to to provide an answer. I won't regret uh, in a couple of weeks from now. I I totally think that that. The return of investment in people working uh, with curating data, it's just the potential is just so big. So whatever you want to call it and wherever you want to place those people, I, I don't really care. But it's just it would be such a phenomenon value for companies to have that. Yeah, That was a safe answer. <laughs> yeah, but, but... It's, it's it's also something that I've been I've been working in like close to twenty years, uh, not completely fifteen years, but you know, working with data, trying to provide value, fighting my way through 
people that don't understand information management, data management, don't understand data uh, technologies such as data catalogs. And you just, you just want to provide value to the company that you're in. And I think that value provided by such people, it's just, it's just, it's 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 so much more uh, proportionally to 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 the salary that these people are paid that, yeah. Personally, I can't understand why it has more hasn't more attention. All right, all right, Tim. Last one. All right, last question. Will the catalog space still exist in five years, or is it turning into something else, like knowledge search or some other thing? Yeah. Personally, uh, I think that you have also mentioned this earlier, Juan. So I think it's okay to say that it wasn't a marketing person that invented the term data catalog. Um, it's a difficult sell because people don't know what it is. The core capability, like seen from an enterprise architecture perspective, the core capability will remain. It will just evolve, become more powerful. Whatever we call it uh, may change, but the capability itself will remain also in five years. Yeah. So that's more, of a, more of a naming and marketing thing, but yeah. the capabilities are there. I, I, I agree with this. And I think we need to have an overview but, but, of data. We need to search for data. Yeah. But I, and knowledge. Yeah, totally. But that and knowledge in a data world is, is a, data is a prerequisite for knowledge. Okay. Well, but and sometimes I think these uh, sometimes these terms are sticky, right? Like how many people are in the BI space and love the term BI, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, Tim, T T T tick. Tim takes us away with takeaways. You go All first, right. my friend. So great discussion today, and today we focused on catalogs, which a lot of times we don't we don't always focus directly on catalog. We talk about how all these other things that are going on with the data landscape that catalog intersects with. So this is awesome. Really love this conversation. And Ole, you're obviously a, a, a huge expert in this area, so honored to have you here. Um, so you you started off with kind of like, well, what should a catalog do, and what makes it unique? Uh, and you said that it really has to effectively allow you to search and discover your structured and your unstructured data. Uh, and, in, and you really kind of focused on, you know, like when, when Juan asked, why, you know, what are folks not thinking about enough when it comes to a catalog? And it, like, I think the strong focus on a good search experience was a really, really clear theme on a lot of what you were talking about. Um, and uh, really pushing, uh, you know, what are folks not thinking enough about? Well, they're not thinking enough about how they can efficiently organize their metadata and their knowledge for good search. And um, and when we talked more about search, you went into some of the different use cases around search. Like some of them are going to be much more sort of, I wrote down like wide aperture, like you're kind of like, you know, sales and you just want to see, you know, stuff on sales or something like that. Right. And that's going to be a much wider search. And then you're going to kind of re refine from there. Um, but sometimes you really want a narrow aperture where you're really trying to do a precise search. You want less hits. And that's where maybe you're chaining lots of things together. Or you're getting very specific about what it is you're looking for. Or, you know, and I think this is where knowledge comes in a little bit. Well, who are you and what's your role and what's the context that like can affect how you can get to a more narrow aperture? Um, so search, though, search, search, search and, and sort of Google as an example of a sort of an inspiration around this. We mentioned a little bit about data shopping and how data shopping, you know, uh, may or may not really be a core part of this. It's more complementary to this, but it was interesting to go into that discussion a bit. Um, you talked about a little bit around like search in data versus for data and how, um, you know, there might be different search scenarios depending on what you're doing there. And, you know, I kind of argued that maybe, maybe ideally in the future, they're more integrated. Um, and then um, uh, in general, we talked also about like information science and how really information science, library science, these things apply a lot to the world of catalog as well, which I think Juan, that's a good segue to pass to you for your takeaways. Yeah. So, um, all right. So many here. One, the information science. And I think this is this is a call to action for folks listening. One, you definitely have to go see uh, Ole's book. I am so lucky that I've been able to go review it uh, and see what's going on. And I think this is please go look at information, information library science, see it from a different perspective. Um, 
we talk about the information retrieval query language, which is something from your perspective, how you think about it as going back to search, right? You have the spectrum around search. We really talked about ontologies, right? How this is just the way to represent knowledge and how the business works. And we need to start cataloging knowledge around this, right? And how to go do this? Yeah, you start with a business glossary, you go to a thesaurus, right? Then you can start extending more. Catalogs all today do glossaries, but we need to start pushing for more. So if you have a you have a catalog, you're thinking about knowledge. It's much more than a glossary. It's a starting point, but we need to be able to get be able to go represent and catalog more of that knowledge right there. Second, the data life cycle is something that I have to say that I was not thinking about the six months until I started talking to you. Is the what is the posmat? I mean, I'm looking here just at Michael Lee's uh, comment. Right? This conversation is so important. You have given me so much to think about. POSMAD and, and, and DIKR, right? So POSMAD, plan, obtain, store, store, share, maintain, apply, and dispose. You need to think about the data around this. And this, this life cycle needs to be managed within your data catalog. And how do you know how do you want to keep the data or not? Yeah, that, that depends on the industry requirements and regulations, depends on, on your particular domain. Data becomes knowledge, information, which becomes knowledge, actions, and then results. We can't create results just on data. We need that middle layer, which is about what does this data actually mean so, so we can actually generate some results. And at so, the end, what we want is to have a knowledge graph powered by a data catalog. And I think the two very specific things that you're saying, what is a data catalog powered, powered by knowledge graph? It gives you that flexible metadata model that other non-knowledge graph catalogs can give you so you can precisely map your organization actually does and what it means. And second, gives you that entire spectrum of search, just from simple keyword search to all that little high, gonna be very detailed level. So a knowledge, if you have those requirements of having a flexible way of representing your business and having different spectrums of how you wanna go search, then that's a requirement. You need to have a data catalog powered by a knowledge graph. At the end of the day, it's about search, talked about ontologies and knowledge graph, knowledge representing your business data life cycles and focusing on the results and to really achieve everything, search on knowledge, data life cycle and results. It's a knowledge graph. Totally. How did we do? What did we miss on takeaways? Uh, I think you make me sound more clever than I am, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, Hey, but we're just you. summarizing what you just yeah, said. Thank, so. you. thank you. Thank you a lot. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we're going to throw this back to you quickly. So three questions. One, what's your advice about data, about life or whatever? Yeah. Second, who should we invite next? And third, what are the resources that you follow? People, blogs, blogs, podcasts, whatever. Okay. First, uh, first um, uh, I think some advice. Um uh, yeah, so I thought a little about this uh, and actually prepared something. Um, I have always, uh, so this is professional ad advice, right? And I have always uh, followed a, a principle very discreetly, but uh, it's not a secret, but I've just never spoken about it. I have always surrounded myself with people that are more clever than myself. Um, and I have never, ever insisted uh, in being right when I discuss with these people, but I have always insisted on what I know. And that, uh, that is something that, that have, it has given me a very, very uh, uh, nice work life because it gives you the possibility to grow without um, discussion but you need to find people so don't find don't follow famous people follow people uh, at your at, at work that you think are more clever than yourself ask them anything you want to know insist on what you know and learn from that i think that is true for where i work currently actually we have a lot of issues where i work technically but i am very fun to be part of the very small enterprise architecture team um, and very fun of my CIO. So, all right. Yeah. Love that's a very beautiful, beautiful piece of advice, especially that last part. Yeah, what you said is like always insist on what you know. Yeah, yeah. totally. Never, never insist on being right, but always insist on what you know. Okay. Who should we invite next? 
I think you should invite a Swedish professor that is called uh, Jutta Haider. She has written a book, co-authored a book that is called Invisible Search and Online Search Engines. Its uh, second chapter is, I think, the most comprehensive overview of the study of search in the 20th century, actually. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's All a right. Fantastic book. All right. So finally, what resources would you like to share with our audience? What? Uh... Yeah, that one I didn't prepare. I don't really know. Um, I follow so many data podcasts. Uh, I follow your podcast quite intensively. Uh, Monday Morning Data Chat, Data Mesh Radio, Data Engineering Podcast. Uh, I follow, let me see. Um, so I follow the Data Strategy Show, the Data Skeptic, Data Framed, uh, Metadama, uh, Dama Norway, that's Data Management uh, Norway, the Data Chief, Experiencing Data, uh, Soda Podcast, uh, Data Lab Dialogues, Data Creators by Media Usa. He also has a, uh, like a Data Creators Club website, uh, Agile Data, the Data Download. I could go on and on. Wow. Yeah. No, thank you for shouting out for everybody because I think all, all, all those podcasts are fantastic and yeah. and uh, it's almost a full time to go follow everybody there. But oh, this was fantastic. I am so excited. Uh, thank you so much for being us. And just quick reminder, uh, this was episode 99. Uh, we've been doing this for 99 weeks. We've had bonus episodes. We've done more than that. But this is like, Tim, we've been doing this for like over two and a half years. I can't believe it. I this. know. Crazy. And next week then is going to be a hundred. This is crazy. Hundredth episode. And it's going to be actually with the VP of product of uh, five tram with Fraser Harris. Uh, we and it's and next week because it's such it's week 100. We are going to be in London. Tim and I are both going to be in London. Uh, we're going to do the episode. Fraser unfortunately couldn't make it to London, but we'll be there. And we're going to do a special episode on Wednesday and on Thursday, right after our summit. And if you find us a Big Data London, come reach out to us. We have T-shirts for every person who comes to us and tells us who was their favorite guest and why. Uh, we're so much looking forward to meeting a lot of our, our, our audience at Big Data London. And uh, with that, Ole, thank you so much. Thank you, Juan. Thank you, Tim. Here's Ole.